This program is coming to you via Relay 2 satellite, a spacecraft orbiting the Earth at a speed of over 17,000 miles per hour. Exertus. Join us on another exciting adventure of Exertus. Hey, everybody, tune in to Recent Tartarian. Recent Tartarian. Recent Tartarian. Today we're going to go over Little Nemo and the adventures in Slumberland. And Little Nemo is a comic strip from the 1890s. You can actually find a lot of it on the internet on archive.org. And I have some original material from this, which is pretty great because most of the comic book, in fact, there's hundreds of stories that go on for decades, are all about the dream world that Little Nemo visits and is decidedly Tartarian. There are, of course, fantastical things like anthropomorphic moons and magical characters in general, but what you will also notice is the amazing architecture, the pillars, the arches, and somehow the allusion to a deluge or flood. These cityscapes from Little Nemo are remarkably similar to the world's fair cities which we have earlier illustrated in our series. Beyond the comic strip from the 1890s, there actually is a cartoon film from the 1980s, a joint production between Masami Hata and William Hertz, and the brainchild of producer Yutaka Fujioka. Fujioka had long dreamed for years to make a feature-length animated film version of his favorite comic strip, The Little Nemo in Slumberland, which had made waves in the 1950s as being translated into Japanese. In 1977, Fujioka personally flew to Monterey, California to convince the descendants of Windsor McKay, the writer of the original comic strip, who had lived in Santa Cruz, California, to obtain film rights to the comic strip. Over five years, Fujioka found experts in animation from all over the planet, including the United States, Japan, and France, to produce his masterpiece, Little Nemo Adventures in Slumberland. And because of this, the movie has a very interesting look and aesthetic. The characters are neither Japanese nor American nor European. They're a fusion of all three, which is fantastic and actually gives it an even more Tartarian feel. The Western Disney Chuck Jones quality soothes the audience, particularly the children, while the anime quality of Japan elevates the film aesthetically. Meanwhile, the French influences on the illustrations accentuate some of the subtler attributes of existential realism. And the cartoon follows the boy Nemo, who's constantly sleepwalking and waking up after flying around the world on his bed at night. Eventually, he wakes up in Slumberland, in Tartary, with the king of dreams, Morpheus, who takes the boy and shows him his vast magical kingdom. And he even introduces his daughter and promises him her hand, so that he would be eventually the new king of Dreamland after Morpheus. And then Nemo would be in charge of all of Dreamland. So he gives him the key to the entire kingdom. And he tells him that he can open any door. But he should not open one door. The door to Nightmare Land. This is because Morpheus has specifically locked off this room from the psyche of Dreamland. For the sake of protecting the entire kingdom. And it is with this locked door that the kingdom is kept in harmony. An entire city full of dream characters working and living their lives gardening and farming, performing horticulture and tailoring and baking, even inventors and scientists performing great works. It truly is the most spectacular city of dreams. But then along came Flip, and Flip's a great carryover from the 1890s. He's a green-faced wino who smokes a cigar, and it's nice to see such a well-dressed bum in Slumberland. But Nemo is an impressionable boy, so when he meets Flip, it changes his life immediately. He doesn't know yet not to follow the wills and whims of just anybody. 
So as first, he did as he was asked by Morpheus and did not open the door. Now, because Flip has asked him to, he does open the door. And this causes a lot of trouble instantly. In fact, the kingdom is suddenly overrun by evil. And as to the question, hey, what's the worst that could happen? Well, all the worst happens. And so King Morpheus becomes consumed by this black goop and pulled into nightmare land by some sort of demon or anthropomorphic darkness, certainly a monster. And because Nemo flies through slumberland on his bed, this truly is the monster underneath and all around his bed. But along the way, Nemo meets several friends, including a slew of seven demons, trolls covered in fur, and with the hand of the daughter of the King Morpheus, the princess, Camille by his side, along with his feisty and faithful flying squirrel, and the organist and vizier, Nemo faces his fears and flies on his magical bed deep into the caves of the Tartarus, straight into the heart of darkness, into the depths of the nightmare world. And along the way, he faces all sorts of illusions, nightmarish versions of his own reality. He faces reflections of himself and his friends as evil. He sees his parents and all comes into question what it is that he's really fighting for and if it's even possible at all, or if he is just a fool. But as he reaches the depths of the darkness, inspired by the beauty and the love and faith of the princess, as well as her duty, and Nemo's personal grand debt to Morpheus and the kingdom of Tartaria, Nemo, wielding the Spear of Destiny, the Staff of Morpheus, the Royal Scepter. Nemo is faced with the obligation of casting a spell to send the devil back to the depths of Tartarus. And all the while, as his friends sit suffering in an orb as he watches, he's powerless to save them as the Lord of Darkness taunts him, accusing him of being incapable of performing the ritual. Eventually, Nemo is able to perform as he extends his magic scepter and chants the magic words. Jazama, pajama, pajama, kazama, shimera, kazama, kamera, kazama, emerita, zama, pajama, pajada, kazama, shazama, pajama, pajama. Take that, Nightmare King. And what do you know? It works. He saves the king and he saves his friends. And he even saves the princess and gets her in the end. Which comes with the dowry of the giant kingdom of Tartary, which is pretty cool. But the metaphor is left that because of his achievement and ability to perform, Nemo is being left with the keys to the kingdom because they need to go with somebody and he's the one who apparently can handle them. Now it's interesting that this comes from a guy from Monterey and specifically of course Santa Cruz and its influence on this sort of story, particularly the Nightmare Monster, which is very much like an HP Lovecraft character, sort of like the Nyarlathotep. And it's this sort of multi-personality wad of organisms and demons, but also very ethereal and interdimensional that shows up in smokes and is often enchanted through incense. Fire and smoke and the death of trees, the transfiguration of wood, these are some of the recipes for unleashing primordial evils in tradition. But there's a very good recent example of this story as well, which is a cartoon called Fern Gully. And Fern Gully is another Ted Turner production from the Fonda era, when along with setting up the largest nature preserves in the world in the United States, Ted Turner also created a series of propaganda called Captain Planet and an animated feature with Robin Williams, Whoopi Goldberg, and a number of other famous names called Fern Gully. And Fern Gully also tells the tale of trapped titans, evil beings that have been contained for the sake of the betterment of our society and for the well-being of our community. And similarly, the monster from Fern Gully seems like an H.P. Lovecraft monster, but maybe more like the shrub Neuroth, though any number would do because this monster is specifically made of smoke and oil and syrup and sap that comes from the blood of this evil tree, which if you know much about maple syrup, could mean that he's a bunch of crystals. And the film starts out with this character, Zack, played by Jonathan Ward, who experiences a sort of Kafka metamorphosis where a lumberjack who's cutting down old growth Amazonian jungle forests, probably to make elevator buttons, is nearly killed by a falling tree caused by the lumberjack machines that they're operating. Taken pity on by the magical beings of the forest, an extremely low frequency being or elf named Krista, a fairy of curious nature living in Fern Gully, shrinks down Zack to the size of a bug and shows the lumberjack the beautiful magical world of nature, which similarly has a forbidden tree which you're not supposed to eat from or cut down. But at this point, Zack is having a hard enough time dealing with talking animals, magical beings, and not being eaten by lizards. 
And also they meet a character named Batty, who's an escaped research project with a chip and a radio in his head, victim of animal testing. Batty is completely insane, but he's also very smart and remembers everything. He can also hear the radio in his mind so he can regurgitate commercials and music, even the Spanish stations. But as a victim of humans, he has a nervous tick whenever they're mentioned. And maybe rightfully so, because the humans never know what they're doing. And they're always doing crazy, fantastical things, using giant machines, cutting down hundreds of miles of forest a day. And to them, there's no intrinsic meaning behind it. They're just making elevator buttons, if that. So it becomes a pretty interesting philosophical question in this film. Who is the victim and who is the villain? Because these are the men who cut down the tree that make it possible for the evil to take over the planet. And this is the thing that wants to take over the planet and do evil. The powerless thing, I should add, because it was trapped inside of a tree until these naive unleashed the unspeakable evil themselves. And considering that, like most kids' movies, this film ends with extremely positive consequences. So it could be argued that this character is ineffectual and therefore they're basically just mean while the humans are relatively nice guys but they're responsible for the greatest atrocities that all the characters in this film including themselves have to face they're nice guys they're just evil and even the character Zack who experiences this transmutation from being a normal human into again essentially being treated like an insect he finally starts to see the error of his ways and begins to feel remorseful for the part he's played in the destruction of the living beings in the environment and community he's now become part of and this film suggests that we live in harmony with nature but also plays at the ironies of that concept for instance as soon as zach becomes an insect-sized creature, he's nearly consumed by nature, poking fun of the concept of veganism and also the compassionate identity from the urban fantasy of the unnatural wildlife. Less and less nature was available to more and more people, and the few bits of nature that they interacted with disgusted them like cockroaches and rats. Simultaneous to this, propaganda was being published around the planet about the rainforests and the Sahara, as well as the savanna and Serengeti. Children's magazines about animals, beautiful, colorful, and friendly looking in the photos, could not be correlated with the real life experiences of the pests and vermin that they were experiencing in suburbia and in urban zones. Because of this, there was a natural disassociation and compartmentalization between natural wildlife and the remote and the exotic and unnatural seemingly idea of the magical rainforest, a peaceful place in the minds of a child, but belied by the actual existence of predators and, in fact, evil. An evil often overlooked by the humans, and this is a common theme in children's stories, and has been for thousands of years. Where is, is this airing right now? Is this... this program is coming to you via Relay 2 satellite, a spacecraft orbiting the Earth at a speed of over 17,000 miles per hour. Recent Tartarian. Exertus. <laughs>